Right. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you. Thank you one more time for coming into our third webinar. And thank you, Justine. That, that's a very useful and valuable um, kind of a recap on what we tried to work on over the past uh, two sessions. Let me just maybe annotate tool ready. Get my pen ready as well. Okay, so what we will basically do today is uh, try and essentially get some understanding on, on, on what's really going on and what these parameters that we've estimated mean and how we can use some of this information to design better surveys. Now, we'll go back to, uh, to our first study area. You remember we had set up those uh, uh, gummy bears, uh, virtual gummy bears in this case. If you recollect, we had, give me one more second. Video, yeah. Right, so we had essentially set up the uh, the surveys and uh, if you see this was the f the uh, integration area we had assigned these were the camera traps uh, the orange line around the camera traps is the frame which bound uh, which binds our uh, camera traps and these little x's are the activity centers of various snow leopards that we assumed and we knew in this case that the population of snow leopards is 26 animals A to Z. We gave them names and each of them had a number of locations around their activity center, right? So that's just, just quickly going back to that uh, result. Now, <coughs> if you, uh, you might also recollect that we briefly discussed these figures when uh, just before uh, the end of the last session and I had left it here that we get the abundance has been estimated to be 25.39. Now, given that we know there are 26 animals, we estimate 25.4. I think it's fairly accurate and very close to uh, the truth that we know the lower confidence limit, upper confidence limit, well within obviously as the estimate mean is also very close to the, the truth that we are aware of. Now, these parameters we will discuss a little uh, later. We may not be talking about them now. These we will discuss in the last seminar. Let's go, back, go to these parameters. What do the parameters mean? We will talk about the coefficients later. For now, we'll be discussing the parameters. What does density, lambda zero and sigma denote what are these values that we get here denote in our case. And to do that, let me go back to remind you what the image looked like. You remember these were the activity centers. We get a density of snow leopards to be 0 0.01. Now by default, spatial capture recapture, uh, well, specifically this uh, package that we are using, the SCCR package in R, it estimates density per hectare. It assumes that all your coordinates are in meters. Now, if you want to change those, you may need to uh, tweak that. You can do that, but by default, we assume that the coordinates are in meters. Please remember, spatial capture recapture does not work with um, uh, angular data. You cannot provide it latitude longitude data because that's when it might fail because it, it cannot do a uh, uh, transformation on the fly. If you have latitude longitude data, transform it into UTM or any other uh, projection which, uh, which defines the study area in meters. And once you have a projection, that is the map we will ultimately use. So in this case, if you look at this from zero to 8,000 meters, from zero to 5,000 meters, this was our uh, overall uh, space. And the density of 0.1 animals per hectare here means that there was, let's say, one animal per square kilometer. You can easily convert per hectare into uh, per square kilometer, 
or if you want to do in per square meter, it will be 0 0.000, 000, uh, 0, 0, 001. It will basically be divided by the same value, just divided by 10,000. And that gives us the, uh, the value per square meter. Now, in very simple terms, if you multiply the, the length and the uh, width of this space, or multiply it by 0 0.1, 0 0.01, you will end up with the total number of animals uh, in this area, which will be the abundance. What is abundance? N is equal to count multi uh, multiplied by, uh, sorry, area multiplied by density. That's what uh, it is. So if you, if you know the area, if you know the density, you can always estimate the uh, the total number of animals, right? So that's what this density denotes. Uh, if you actually do this calculation, you will end up with 26, 27 snow leopards, which is exactly uh, what the density is. Now, the second parameter we're looking into is the detection probability, or in this case, the encounter rate at activity centers. Now we get a figure, we, we get an estimate in, in this, uh, analysis of 15.57. What does that mean? Now, let's go back and try to understand this. What this basically means is that if I had a camera at the activity center by some fluke chance, you know, I, because in real life, I wouldn't know where the cameras are. I, would, I, I, I wouldn't know where the activity centers are. So by, by fluke, or by chance, if I end up in a situation where I have a camera trap at the activity center, then I might, uh, I'm likely to get 15.57, or let's say 16 encounters on an average. They could be anywhere between 13 or 18. Uh, well, like the 95% confidence interval will be somewhere around this much. Now let's see what it what it means in our case. What I've done here is, I've gone. I've zoomed into the image and I have looked into these three, uh, three cameras, which are very close to the activity center. Uh, this particular camera, uh, C29, is very close to the activity center of the animal named T. The camera number C46 is very close to the activity center, this one of animal A and camera number C36, which is this one, is right adjacent to the activity center of the snow leopard named Q. What I did was I counted how many encounters of these individuals we got on these cameras, and the numbers come to 16, 23, and nine. Roughly, if you average it, it comes out to 16. There are more cameras which were very close to activity centers like this one, and there were others as well. But on an average, if you have your uh, camera trap set up right at the activity center, how many encounters will you end up with by the, by the end of the study is what you get here. So you see there is a very close match in what the likelihood, uh, maximum likelihood uh, method has estimated and what our actual data was. We never told the maximum likelihood estimator, we never told the software, where the activity centers were. We only gave it data, if you recollect, about number of encounters and uh, the location of where the encounters are happening. Okay, now the third point that we will quickly look at is uh, the range of snow leopards. Now in this case, when I was designing this uh, artificial population, we had set the sigma at 300. We had set the sigma at 300, which means two sigma would be 600. Now, if you look at what we have got estimated, what the likelihood estimator has found us, it's claiming that your sigma is around 308 or 309. Now that's fairly close. Look at the 95% confidence limit. It's well within the, the truth that we are aware of because that's how the data was generated, even though it was generated with the, uh, with the normal distribution we still know that when, when these data, when, when the activity center, these little dots were created, they were created in a way that the sigma would be 
600 would be 300 meters. In other words, if you count the distance from the activity center till wherever the sort of 95% uh, range is, you will end up this distance, you can measure it down here, is going to be roughly around 600. Try it for not just one, but many of them, you will end up with the same calculations here. And you can see closely, they all have nearly the same um, sort of activity centers, uh, activity range sizes. And this is exactly as Justine explained a few minutes ago, where sigma denotes the ranging pattern. Okay, so again, there is a very close match in what we knew as reality, as truth, versus what the solver has found us in our case. Now, uh, the next point, I would just like to re-emphasize that what are the data requirements for cap spatial capture recapture? Uh, based on whatever you have received, what we have seen here and the kind of data that we generated, there are two key data requirements. One, you need multiple encounters to build detection functions. That's number one. And number two, you need several snow leopards encountered on more than one unit to be able to, to create that kind of a function for different individuals. And these are the two basic requirements uh, to be for the spatial capture recapture analysis to be able to come up with reliable or, or, or reliable estimates of uh, animal abundance. Now, let me, what we will now do is uh, to get, uh, you know, we basically have some idea about how this worked with an artificial population of gummy bears, artificial gummy bears. Now let's try to apply this into snow leopard world. Now we have, we have some idea about how spatial capture recapture works. And we will now go back to one of the three study areas that we've been discussing. I'll first take, we will go to the, in fact, throughout this session, we'll just stick to this one specific landscape which is that of the Spiti landscape. The, if you remember, the snow leopard distribution in this landscape was more or less random. Yeah, there was a random distribution of animals within the study area, and that's, that's where we will go. The reason we are doing this is because 300, sigma 300 doesn't make any logical sense in case of snow leopards. That small area that we just looked at doesn't really make any sense. Uh, so to, to try to bring it close to home, we'll just look at one of these examples. Uh, it, it's a very simple situation that you know, uh, you saw the map around Spiti in this hypothetical example. Remember, the snow leopard abundance or snow leopard distribution is random. Now, each of these snow leopards here denotes the activity center of different snow leopards, 50 different snow leopards that are living in this uh, particular uh, landscape that you see in front of you. What I'm doing is for simplicity's sake, I'm just replacing those snow leopard icons with simple red cross. And that's just so that they're easily visible and do not clutter the view. Now, in this case, what I'm doing is to begin with, instead of, um, let's say, uh, you know, setting up random camera traps, let, let's say, again, this is to keep things simple and easy to understand. We are setting up 56 camera traps uh, pretty far from each other. Now, this is the first scenario we're assuming. We have a large sampling frame. We are hoping that with just one camera trapping effort, we should be able to cover everything and we should be able to represent the whole study area. Uh, and uh, what we do here is uh, we set up uh, cameras almost 10 kilometers from each other um, and we create this very wide grid. Uh, and what, what it really means is that each snow leopard will have uh, one or less cameras in its range to get its uh, selfies taken. How will that look like? I'll just give you a little uh, visual into it. I assume this is one snow leopard wh whose activity center is somewhere here. And it freezes. And with this one snow leopard with an activity center right there, as time progresses, the snow leopard keeps getting captured on one or two cameras. There it goes, it gets captured on one camera. And in a short while, there it, oops, yeah. Uh, okay, there were these, I think, 
right there we go so it did get captured on these two um, uh, twice on this camera which was right next to its activity center once on this further away camera none on this one none on this one none on this one and none on this one despite the fact that there are some movements around these areas in other words the snow leopard was here in these areas as well but it just did not spend enough time which means the probability of it getting detected remained pretty fairly low it looks like okay uh, so what we see here is uh, we are basically giving it just we have given it just three opportunities to this one snow leopard to get uh, encountered during the entire study now instead of one snow leopard the same thing can be done for all the 50 snow leopards whose activity centers are randomly located as we are aware, and we are aware of it right we know those activity centers as these x x's that you can see what we see here, see here is that each snow leopard has uh, a few cameras maybe typically in this case because the camera traps are so widely spaced they have one or less than one camera to uh, to get its selfie taken on now the problem is that e even with known activity center centers we find that uh, it, okay let me show you what exactly is going on we will find how the detection function is going to build up um right now what we see here is that if you look at uh, these uh, these grids closely you will see the the uh, cameras where you've had encounters and then these are cameras where we've had no encounters right so you can det detect you can see a number of cameras have had detections which is good news that even though camera traps were spread pretty sporadically we did end up with quite a few encounters but what it what it really means is that we've had a f in in other other words if you look here we've had in total uh, 33 snow leopards that got captured that's a fairly good number for a population of 50 that's a good number not bad we've had 32 camera traps on which we've had encounters again not bad the total number of encounters has been 43 we would have ideally wanted much more but let's say this is what we have at this point in time now when we go out and see how this gets plotted uh, let's look at the uh, the blue uh, map uh, the blue uh, the, the blue graph first what you see here is the distance from the activity center that we know right in this case we know the activity center of each snow leopard from that distance as the distance increases you see over time it's reducing but if you look carefully we have just seven encounters in the entire study for the closest distance from the activity center we have just about eight now this could be this could have been six this could have been eight but as a matter of chance we've ended up with eight and then six and less and again here there are more now this is the actual encounter rate that we have generated uh, if you look at the red map you will realize that most snow leopards have ended up with just one encounter there are only one two three four five six seven eight snow leopards with two encounters each and only one snow leopard with three encounters now that's a not a very good situation that we are dealing with this is where we already know what the distance from activity center is but if you look at the quality of data we may not have a lot of confidence in being able to say how is the detection function going to be looking like maybe this is expressing the detection function to be something like this or it has to be dipping here if we had more data maybe it would have become taller here and something like this would have formed we have no clue in this case and the, that's one of the reason why putting camera traps out too wide can often become a bit of a problematic situation now let's consider the second sampling scenario and this is typically how it happens in many parts you you get about 10 12 cameras you uh, you set them up in the field in a very small area 
and then you expect the data to be useful for abundance. Now, what this generates, as you can see, the good news here is that all the 12 cameras ended up with encounters, which is good. Uh, by chance, this is what also happens is that you are always uh, inclined when you ask people where, where I, have, I have 10 cameras, I want to photograph snow leopards, either the local people or your own experience from the area will, will bias your sampling to an area where you know there are many snow leopard signs or there are possibly a few snow leopard activity centers. Well, there is, there is a conflu confluence of more than one individuals. When you set up your camera traps here, then you will end, by chance, we've ended up with each of our 12 camera traps with snow, uh, snow leopard photographs. Now, what does the detection function look like? If you look here, again, 10, we know this activity center. Please remember we are aware of this and that's why we are able to plot it. But for a known distribution, we know that there were 10 animals, 10 encounters at a very close distance from the activity center, fewer further away and so on. But look at these massive gaps. Yes, the model will be able to do some sort of a prediction, but it will probably predict it somewhere like this. Now, what it will end up doing is by chance, it will uh, underestimate my sigma and that could become a challenge. Uh, if you look at the red, uh, red uh, bars here, you will see that again, one, two, three, four, four snow leopards have ended up with just one encounter each. Yes, there, is, there are a couple of snow leopards for who we've got a lot of encounters like the snow leopard number 15, the snow leopard number 25, uh, number 30, they've, they've given us a, uh, more than one encounters. Now, this is a useful estimate because in this case, I don't, I'm sorry, I must have forgotten mentioning this, but if you go back, yeah, if you go back here, you will see that there were 24 encounters, fairly good number. Each of the 12 camera traps had encounters and we had a total of eight individuals which were recorded on these. Now, eight individuals meaning someone living pretty far must have also gotten captured here. Someone from here must have gotten captured here. Someone from here may have gotten captured in one of these camera trap, uh, in camera trapping areas. So they may have, we may, the camera traps may have ended up capturing animals whose activity centers were pretty far away from uh, from this grid, but still within the uh, the known sigma. But another important point here to remember is that in this case, we we have the, the data that we generated, we generated it in a way that uh, the animals, uh, the sigma was six kilometers. And this is based on a recent uh, camera trapping study from exactly the same study site. So we, are tr we tried to keep it as close to real life scenario. So we knew Sigma and based on that, we are just doing these four or five different simulations. So ultimately what you do end up is you do end up with some sort of a curve. It's looking good, but it's again a little too weak because we have very little data to deal with. And it, uh, till here it's fine, but over here the curve could have taken any shape. We have no idea uh, we are assuming the curve is taking this shape and we will hope that that's the truth. But again, we could be, uh, the sigma could be smaller or bigger as a matter of chance than what it actually is, which is 6,000 meters here. Uh, now moving on to the next design. This is the intermediary cam uh, sampling frame where camera traps were set up. Uh, roughly around four to five kilometers from uh, from each uh, uh, from each other. Now, if you look at th this scenario, you end up with quite a few encounters. If I remember correctly, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it here, but we have nearly 150 or 140 encounters so uh, uh, in total, some somewhere a, a pretty high number, and almost all cameras apart from these three got, in fact, this, these four, five six, seven, sorry, <laughs> all cameras apart from these seven did end up with snow leopard encounters. A fairly good, good uh, uh, 
uh, number of encounters. And now look at how the curve looks like. Now, yes, there is a bit of a uh, bit of a, an un, unwanted noise here, but apart from that little noise, you can see that it's giving us a fairly, fairly uh, a high resolution function here, a function which, uh, which emulates uh, the half normal distribution. And yes, we may not have had as many individuals as in some, uh, in the first design where we ended up capturing a lot of individuals, but not much data in between. Here we have captured a few, but we have uh, many recaptures and many recaptures have also happened in more than one camera. What this provides us is with a lot of substantial good quality data to be able to estimate uh, the detection function and hence the three unknown parameters, which is sigma, uh, which is that of ranging parameter, the activity center, uh, the, the encounter rate at the activity center, and ultimately the density of snow leopards. Now there is one more scenario that is uh, that is a, a new one, but uh, incidentally it's turned out to be a very powerful one. And it and this is this is pretty uh, unintuitive, if you may say so. Uh, we have grown with uh, we have we have learned over time the best possible sampling designs, which are uniform, no holes, fairly decent coverage, and so on. Now this is quite quite contrary to that design. What we are doing here is we have basically clustered it. Now we have a cluster of, we have four clusters of 12 cameras each. Now, again, for simplicity's sake, I've just made these four clusters. You could have had three clusters and a few uh, additional cameras, uh, cameras around it if, if needed. But in this case, let's, uh, let's say these, this is a cluster of um, 12 cameras each. We do get to count 17 different snow leopards on these 48 cameras, which is a pretty good number. We do end up snow leopards getting encountered or 32 camera traps, again, a very good number. And the total number of encounters remains 55, which too is a fairly good number. Uh, now look at how the detection function looks like in this case. Now you can see there is a long tail Yes, there is a bit of a challenge here. We have to kind of assume some of it, but with, and, and this is, let's say half the actual sampling that we typically do. We typically try to aim for sampling where you end up with, um, with not just 50, but let's say about a hundred encounters, right? At least a hundred encounters, the more the better. But if we have a study where we end up with a hundred encounters or so, we hope that it would have possibly filled up some of these gaps in between, but you see a fairly, fairly reasonable and explainable uh, activity uh, detection function building as, it function, uh, 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 as the distance from the activity center increases. Now, what's happening in terms of encounters, you see not a lot of individuals, but those, that in, those individuals which have been captured, we have quite a few encounters for each of them, more than one. So ultimately you need to remember that when you're doing spatial capture recapture, it's really important to get snow leopards to get photographed on more than one unit. Otherwise the solver or the, uh, the, or the likelihood estimator has to really make a lot of guesswork. And that guesswork can at times become a bit of a problematic issue if we end up with randomly a few additional points at a, at a certain distance, it can completely throw the entire analysis out of, out of sync, out of gear. Um, and uh, and that's, that's something we need to be very careful about. Now, just to give you a slightly better uh, understanding of what really is happening here, what if we had traps everywhere, every meter of this entire 8,000 square kilometer area was studded with camera traps. You, in other words, uh, you know there there were camera traps everywhere. The the, the function that you see here, the, this this particular uh, curve, is nothing but the distance of each point from its from that particular snow leopard's activity center. So if if distance from here, 
distance from here, distance from here, and so on. So if we, for each of these snow leopard, I have estimated the distance. And when I pull it all together, it gives me a very neat uh, half normal function. Do you see this function is emulating how a normal function would be uh, if, the, if the data was complete? Well, that's good, right? This is how it would have been, the world would have been if we had 100% encounter of everything that, that's out there. In reality, we all know that this is uh, seldom possible. So what we end up with is a scenario, uh, which is this one. Now on the left-hand side, what all I have done is I've just animated the four designs. You see each of them is taking a relatively similar shape as uh, you, you see on the right-hand side, but some of them fare better than the others. And the reason some of them fare better than the others is almost entirely dependent on the design. Look at the cluster design, look at the intermediary design, look at the large uh, study design and the small design. Each of them has its pros and cons, values, and it really does end up generating a fairly reasonable and usable data set for us. Ultimately, uh, what we are really saying here is that the most effective sampling in this case is that uh, is the one which either uses an intermediary sampling design or a clustered design. Uh, and the key here to remember is that you either assume that the gaps in the cluster design uh, uh, example are addressed by covariates or the actual animal density in, the, in this cluster, uh, in the gaps between the, the clusters was the same as it was in these areas that were sampled. So in other words, think of it as uh, multiple small samples, exactly how we, uh, we did uh, many, uh, well, not many, many sessions ago, but just uh, one session ago in the, in the first session, we had these sampling designs. That's exactly the kind of situation we're looking at here. All we need is more data to be able to estimate the unknowns uh, in, in our case. And uh, moving on, right, yeah. So you remember when we were discussing sampling designs, what was it that we had in mind? We want to, we want to be able to uh, improve our errors, right? Now in this case, what are we estimating? There are three things that we are estimating. We just, just a quick revision here. We are estimating the number of activity centers. We don't know that in real life. We're estimating the activity range of how far a snow leopard ranges and what is its half, uh, uh, um, half range and what is its, uh, let's say 95% range. And then we are interested in how many snow leopards will get encountered if we had a camera at its activity center because once we know what's the status at the activity center, we can always use the detection function further away from it uh, as, a, a, as a half normal distribution in this case uh, to be able to estimate the, the encounter rates at f distances further from there, right? So these are the three unknowns that we are trying to estimate in this case. Now, what is our sampling unit? the number of snow leopards because each snow leopard here is a is a is a sampling unit now uh, one snow leopard may have an activity center uh, an, an activity range or let's say a sigma of 3 kilometers another snow leopard may have a sigma of 8 kilometers a third snow leopard may have a sigma of 6 kilometers one more may have 5 there is always going to be variation in the in the, in the size of the range that snow leopards use, even though the average will be very close to uh, what snow leopards are uh, typically known for. But think about it as a situation where males and females may have variations within their range. Uh, 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 territorial individuals versus uh, floaters may have variation in, in their distribution range and so on. So the first sampling unit in our case is the number of snow leopards and we need to really maximize the number of snow leopards that we sample in a study. If you are trying to go and estimate sigma based on just one or two individuals that you capture in a small study area, 
as would typically happen in case of a uh, of very small sampling design with just 10, 12 cameras. You might be able to say something uh, about that particular snow leopard, but it's the same situation where if I go back to our first example of Lego, and if I ask Shoeb, Shoeb, what's your height? And Shoeb says, I'm 175 centimeters tall. Uh, I'll just write a note saying that all people from, let's say all, all men from Pakistan are 175 centimeters tall. Now, it's not wrong. It's just that I, I have just used a single sample to estimate what is the average height of people from Pakistan or men from Pakistan. I might be completely wrong in terms of the reality. I might be at the tail of the average uh, of the confidence limits. I might be at the center of the confidence limit, but I have no data to prove it. Similarly, if we only end up with estimating the detection function of snow leopards based on only one individual, then we are making a huge leap of faith where we are assuming that all snow leopards are using the same sort of detection uh, functions or, or ranging parameters. And that's something we have to be careful about, which is why we want to maximize the number of snow leopards that we encounter. But the second thing we need to maximize is the number of encounters. Now, if you end up with, uh, with one snow leopard on each camera trap, uh, many times, uh, let's say there is a camera C10, and on C10, there is a snow leopard with the name um, uh, 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 Ranjana. And Ranjana has get, uh, gotten trapped on that particular camera trap, let's say 20 times. That's fine. But that camera trap, whether it is at the activity center, whether it is at, the, uh, at somewhere, uh, you know, whether it is at the activity center or somewhere uh, further, now, those 20 could be these, it could be this, it could be this. If this is 20, the number of encounters at activity center would be, let's say, 50 or, or something. If this was 20, then it could be 60. If the, if the activity center had 20 encounters, but we have no clue, again. So unless we get one, e, one snow leopard captured on multiple cameras, it's very difficult for us to be able to uh, for the solver to be able to make a good prediction of what the num what the encounter rate at the activity center could be given a detection function that can be generated. In other words, we will have no idea about what the sigma is if we don't have the same snow leopard caught on multiple cameras. If we don't have these situations, we will have just one uh, encounter and we'll never be able to tell where it is within the uh, within the activity range. And the third point, as I again, I'm just mentioning it again, we need a number of distances, uh, which is precisely the same point. We need multiple encounters, but we also need uh, multiple distances uh, of each animal from their activity center. So we need more than one definitely more than one for definitely more than one snow leopard so that we can end up creating some sort of data, broken data, yes, but the model works fairly well as you've just seen with this, with such broken data, with limited uh, information that it does a fairly good job of predicting uh, the, the numbers. Now, if these are our uh, sampling units, how do we reduce errors? The way we reduce errors is, you remember these three points. You increase the samples, you stratify, or you model. All of the three are possible. How do we increase samples? Increase the number of camera traps incre uh, to get more snow leopards captured. Increase the number of, uh, 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 increase or, or set up your camera traps at positions where you can get uh, a lot of encounters and make sure your camera traps are positioned in a way that they get more than one. Uh, each snow leopard gets uh, an op at least a chance to be photographed on more than one camera, or, or more than one snow leopards get a chance to get cap captured on several cameras. And similarly, stratification can be done. Just look at a uh, possible scenario where you may have male uh, and female snow leopards. Now, in some cases in camera traps, it's usually a bit difficult unless you have long-term data that Justine will, uh, uh, will talk about shortly. 
but in other cases, you end up with a situation where uh, you, you do have data about uh, the sex of the uh, of the species and there is a quite likely possibility that males ha may have bigger home ranges than females now if you don't have enough data then it would be useful to kind of stratify it already or or create a model using the same thing to be able to estimate the abundance of male and female separately or just use the modeling approach to try and estimate your uh, abundant, uh, your your uh, uh, ranging parameters, or encounter um, uh, uh, encounter rate at the activity centers. Now, the basic sampling advisory for spatial capture recapture is that number one, we should try and exclude areas to begin with, which are not represented or being used by snow leopards from an integration space. We will discuss this more uh, later in the next class, uh, but uh, it's very important to exclude areas where snow leopards, where you're not either not setting up cameras and you have, you're going to be uh, unable to sample a certain area. It could be altitude, certain altitude you might be unable to uh, survey so cut it out. You, you, you will have no idea what the animal distribution is there. If, if you are aware of a certain habitat, let's say a, a, a small town or a, or a village or uh, uh, a steppe where snow leopards cannot have an activity center, snow leopards do not, uh, are not likely to be having their activity centers, then those areas also need to be excluded from the, uh, from the uh, integration area. What we do need is to survey long enough to get several encounters so that we can build these capture, uh, these detection uh, uh, functions uh, based on those um, repeat encounters. And lastly, one must try and make, uh, find a way to use enough traps to get several encounters of several animals on several traps. That's, that's like too many severals, but this really helps keep it in mind whenever you're designing a survey, if you keep these three, four points in mind, I think that really helps. Um, so with that, we'll just stop here. Uh, there are some, some interesting uh, discussions we will have in the next session about specific uh, processes where we will be able to model. But for now, we'll just move on. And I have a few questions, uh, which, often, uh, which is often what we end up facing. So why don't we open the chat window and uh, suggest what your suggestion would be in case you're sampling an area where there are not enough snow leopards to begin with. It could be a low density area where there's not enough prey or there's poaching that goes on. For, or for some reason, you just have one study area, which has just, let's say three or four snow leopards or maybe yeah, just three or four snow leopards, uh, or maybe less. What, will, what do we do in such a scenario? Uh, what are the alternate ways and means to address uh, such a realistic possibility uh, if you are ever faced with it? So please feel free to open the chat window and uh, let your comments start rolling, please. No question, no answer is a terrible answer. So just, it's great for us, even if you, if we say anything, we can discuss it. Because yeah. what you're thinking is probably what everyone's thinking, right, Christopher? <laughs> Absolutely. There's no, the, yeah, no answer is a wrong answer, Justine, as yeah. you rightly said, yes. <laughs> See, the, you know, I mean, we're talking about probability theory, right? There is a probability of, of me living in the, uh, in the South Pole right now. Now, yes, the probability might be 0, 0.000, but there is a pro certain probability with which I am at the South Pole as well. So there's no wrong answer. Go ahead. It's only probabilistic. Puji, I'm glad she's, you're there, Puji. <clears throat> okay, that's a good point. 
now let me start annotating. So um, try to monitor for several years. Good idea. What else? Come on, think, think, think. What will, what you can possibly do here? Expand sampling area, fair enough, Joe. Mm -hmm. Increase number of cameras um, to capture more, okay. Mm, yeah. Good. Um, uh, read it as record. Hey, please correct me if I missed the spelling. I'm I never I'm never able to remember the spelling of reconnaissance. <laughs> okay. Aha, Wajid is making an interesting point. I think that's the same point as Puji's increased number of captures, maybe mm, related to. I I didn't see. Well, I think Puji mentioned that try to monitor for several years, wasn't that? And unless I missed it. And she so, also said increase number oh, yeah, of cameras. Yeah. Third point, I guess third point can be um, okay. uh, increase yes. Yes. density, it's almost density of camera traps. Yes, okay. Um, confirm number of individuals, okay. Um, okay. Increase area, Arslan says. Okay. Yeah, so wonderful. Really very, very, very delightful to see uh, all these responses. As, I, as Justine said, none of these are wrong. They're all valid ways, valid methods of trying to uh, improve your data. Now, uh, one second. Uh, okay, yeah. Now, just one thing which you might want to uh, also consider, and that often becomes a very useful, uh, useful uh, kind of a strategy is, um, Now this is an, a, a very, one of the most powerful flexibilities that spatial capture recapture allows us uh, to play with. When I, meet, when I say borrow information from other areas, I'm not saying that you go to another area, estimate it separately and then bring in and use that value. What I'm saying is there are means within the spatial capture recapture analysis to, to deal with these uh, with these two areas as sessions. Now in one session in, or in one area where you're sampling, you might have a lot of captures uh, and recaptures and you have a fairly good idea of what the detection function could be. You can use, you can test if the same is true for this low density area and predict the density or the abundance for that area you can even test uh, by adding those covariates uh, that, okay, we, we, sub, we, we are anticipating that the detection functions uh, or the encounter rates or the density between these two areas are completely different. And then you can always borrow this data from one area to the other uh, and, and test it, its validity. What it really allows us is to be able to uh, to be able to expand the sampling where we are, we are, we are, we may, we may, we are uh, able to then survey low density areas as is being done currently under pause into many sites which do not seem to have 
too many snow leopard encounters, many parts of Pakistan for that matter, many parts of India, as recently was surveyed, and many parts of Mongolia as well. I mean, you have your camera set out for three months and you have like seven, eight, in, in some cases, really seven or eight encounters in total. And, and, and yes, there will be times where you put 100 cameras in one small area <clears throat> and you will still end up with like you know, 10, 12 encounters just by, uh, because, of, because of various factors that could be uh, playing out there. So it's really important that uh, we, we look at these possibilities and play around uh, and make use of those, um, uh, those, um, uh, those parameters that are estimated with better data, and then we can kind of make use of it to uh, to help or to give a lending, uh, to helping, give helping hand to the other side. There are assumptions in that, but I think those can be dealt with fairly easily. Justine, am I missing anything here? No, that's good. I just, uh, maybe to add, I see Helena said maybe that just represents the status, but I mean, the point is maybe with, for example, with pause, we do want uh, estimates from high density and low density because that's what we're going to input into a national or global estimate. So we still need, we would still want a density estimate for a low density area. Um, so in this case, we could borrow information. So that's why it might be useful. In other cases, okay, if we get four snow leopards, maybe there's no need to go into density if, you know, maybe your project doesn't need that. But in, if you do really want to get that density estimate, then it could, this is a way to do it, right? Just yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, what if you don't have enough cameras? What do we do in this case? Please let your suggestions come rolling in. How many is not enough cameras, Kustu, would you think? <laughs> Generally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good question, Justine. Uh, so far, based on whatever little uh, work we've done, uh, we we seem to have a fairly good kind of uh, uh, an understanding that anywhere between 30, 40 cameras is a good starting number. The more the, the, you have, the better it is. So it's not really contingent to having, um, you know, uh, okay, if you have 40, I cannot do more. Uh, I cannot set up more cameras here, but uh, truly one can really, um, yeah, that's, that's the minimum number we are looking at. Uh, in any area. But yeah, what if you have 12 cameras or 15 cameras, uh, as we had in the first scenario? And I think we have one good suggestion that came in, which was uh, roll camera trap, okay, uh, uh, rotate camera trap locations. Good idea. That's a fairly good suggestion. Um, sample intensively in blocks. Yep, more or less the same thing. What else? Prefer mountains. Um, yeah, but we really have 15 cameras. That's all we have. What do we do with these? Well, one of the very naive and uh, still always a useful suggestion is don't try to calculate snow leopard abundance. If you have just 10 cameras, 12 cameras, do something else with it. Try not to uh, make too much out of that limitation that you have, right? So if, if you really are constrained uh, with a good number of uh, sampling uh, of, of your traps, then probably, yes, you can try to rotate them and sometimes it works very well. But you also have to remember when we were discussing it in the beginning, I think last session we discussed, animal ranges change between seasons as well. So if you're rolling them over, rotating them from one side to another side, uh, and the season changes, your sigmas will change, your uh, lambda zero will change, 
And there is a likelihood that if the, those do change, your densities may also vary a little bit, at least in those smaller blocks. So you have to be very mindful of what is practically achievable in this small, um, uh, with the small units. And uh, uh, yes, Joe, it is possible to stratify, uh, but yes, your second point is really uh, the best suggestion at this point in time. Just use it for pilot, just use it to come up with some, uh, some basic parameters which can then help you come up with, uh, with enough reason to get sufficient cameras and analyze that. All right. Okay. Any other point, Justine? No, that's good. I think focusing on the, the pilot study is uh, important to understand also what Joe said, to try to understand if your stratify assumption maybe is correct. That could be a way as well to do so. Okay. All right. Next point. What if you don't have enough identifiable encounters? So you have set up cameras, but you have, let's say you have 40 cameras and uh, you've just not found enough encounters. What do you do in that scenario? Or many photos are, you can't yeah, you do don't ID. Get, yes, you don't. Yeah, you can't do ID. What do you do in that situation? Mm -hmm. Come back to the camera trap training to learn how to set up camera traps. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah, this is a bit of a confounded question. I mean, there can be multiple connotations from this. Yes, you're very right, Ranjana. If you have encounters, but you can't identify individuals in, in a majority of them, maybe a better al alternative would be to use occupancy sort of uh, kind of an analysis with the, with the same data. Very, very good suggestion indeed, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Uh, no, very good. Both you and Rinjan, I think, sent the messages right at the same time. Great. Yeah. Any other point, Justine, that we should mention here? No, I think that's fine. Okay. We have, but there's actually a paper that does this, uses the same data to look at occupancy on camera trap. Yes. Um, we Isn't can that share yours? that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very cool paper, yes. <laughs> cool, okay, great. Okay, so with that, uh, I'll stop sharing now. Um, there are some interesting nuances uh, which we will talk about in the next session about uh, uh, how to deal with, for example, you know, you, you end up with camera traps that are different like you have one very high quality camera trap and you have a poor quality camera trap. What do you do with those scenarios? How do you deal with those uh, situations? Or if you have your sampling going on for too long, what do you do in that situation? Or if you have uh, a lot of variation in your uh, individuals or your ability to encounter animals at certain locations. We'll deal with those variabilities in the next session, but uh, for now, over to Justine. Yeah, so Ranjana, the, uh, sorry, there's one good okay. suggestion, yeah, sure. uh, question about mark recite. Yes, it is possible. The only problem with mark recite is that you need, you still need to know which individuals you are unable to identify. So, you know, while it looks a very uh, nice alternative to mark, uh, to capture recapture, the recite is that 
a particular individual is is unidentifiable right if there is a snow leopard with no markings and oh, let, well then of course there is only one snow leopard with no markings but if there are five snow leopards which have no patterns then these five snow leopards cannot be identified so you know that a priori and that's one of the challenges with mark site it looks a very intuitive way to go but it has a big constraint that we probably and, and mark site is actually a model which was developed with tagged animal that you know it's tagged but you don't know which tag it is uh, so so that kind of a uh, of a, yeah, kind of an error you can still work with mark site but not in this case you don't really know which of those individual is is the one you saw and now you're not able to identify you know so you can't you can't club them in a group there so that's a bit of a challenge so for now i think the best would be to really a uh, study occupancy b improve your cameras get better cameras try to get better cameras and i think uh, justine will talk a lot about this and it's a very nice uh, discussion towards the end which will lead us to the next uh, uh, session with Justine, but uh, but really get get better units. You know, you, you might end up doing a better job. Okay, so over to Great, Justine. and uh, because we're already, uh, you guys are, we want to make sure you're awake for the next session. We'd like everyone to turn on your camera. Crystal, yes, we're going to do this again. Turn on your camera, and we would like everyone to stand up. And even if you don't want to turn on your camera, but please, please stand up. Um, stand I have no up. idea Justine was actually going to do uh, Ranjana, come on, Raki, we want you to do, join in too. Stand up and, and just hiding. shake. You're hiding. <laughs> no, come on. Come on, we need everyone on camera. We don't have everyone, everyone on camera. Ranjana, we just want you to warm up and, you know, we're not made to sit in our office uh, on seats all day. So just shake, shake, shake. Um, yes, Ranjana, shake your shoulders, shake your shoulders up and down. Yeah. Now shake your feet, shake your toes. Shake, shake, shake. <laughs> <laughs> so was like everyone looks like one, one last time. I know Joe, you're doing it in the pretending to do it. Just hope you are. <laughs> okay, and then take it inhale and ha. Ah. Okay, let's come back. Really nice guys. Just to make sure you guys lovely. are all awake. Yeah, lovely. We can go into a dance. Wonderful group we have. <laughs> Wonderful group we have. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well done, Vajit. So, well done, Arslan, Ranjana, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>